So I'm very pleased to start off with to welcome Amelia Fletcher. Uh, so Amelia should be appearing on screen any minute. Amelia is a professor of competition policy at Norwich Business School and deputy director at the Centre for Competition Policy. She's also a non-executive director of the CMA and an editor of the Journal of Competition Law and Economics. She was recently a member of the Treasury Commission Digital Competition Expert Panel, which reported in March uh, 2019. So very pleased to, to welcome you, Amelia, and really uh, interested to hear uh, your remarks on this topic. Thanks so much, Laura. And just to say, I'm going to keep this fairly short. I think um, uh, we'll let let Ollie have a little bit longer for his uh, description of the report. But just to say, I think this is a really valuable and very timely event and um, the numbers of um, participants I can see online in front of me, um, uh, I think shows just how much interest there is in this area. I think it kind of follows on from the CMA's really excellent uh, two reports on online choice architecture from last year which really highlighted how particular practices can steer consumer decision making in ways that are um, maybe in the interest of um, the suppliers who design the choice architecture, but not necessarily in the interests of end users themselves. And the implications of this for both consumer protection and competition policy so here today, the issue is less on what firms might be doing unilaterally and more on ways that regulators might intervene to change things, but often again in terms of requiring changes to, to choice architecture in one way or another. Um, and so why is this so timely? Partly because there is a growing use of experimental methods across academia and across government to assess ex ante the likely effects of these sorts of interventions. And that can be hugely useful. Um, however much we know about uh, behavioural economics, however many behavioural insights we gain about the behaviour of real consumers, actually the likely impact of choice architecture upon them is really very strikingly hard to predict uh, ex ante. You can often predict the general direction of um, steering, for example, but the extent of the effect can be really, really hard to assess. Um, and therefore, it really is critical that rather than trying to kind of guess up front how different interventions might work, uh, that wherever possible, it, it makes a lot of sense if it's obviously uh, cost effective and uh, proportionate um, to test this empirically. Um, and I would note that this can be really valuable in optimising the design of interventions. So you can try lots of different interventions and see which ones actually have an impact and which ones have a bigger impact. And you can create a, a kind of perfect letter, for example, or a perfect choice architecture, not perfect, but a better choice architecture that that um, will be as good as possible at uh, changing behaviour in the way that you want to change it. But actually, interestingly, sometimes and some of the use of these experiments have shown that an intervention is just not even worth doing at all. So I think there was a, um, a study a few years ago done by the FCA into different ways of framing exchange rates for consumers, um, which concluded, I think, to the researchers surprise that none of them really had any major impact. Um, and I believe that that proposed intervention was abandoned and that has to be a better outcome for all concerned than putting in place uh, an intervention that effectively has no impact and there have been some of those in the past um, so I think that actually trying to get uh, proportionate interventions that actually make a difference is what we should we should be about and that's where all of this fits in. Um, in terms of timeliness I would also note the context of the development of pro-competition uh, digital markets regulation. Obviously, the UK regulation is still going um, through the legislative process and that process needs to 
be completed before the CMA starts to put in place rules. So we don't know exactly what those rules will be yet, but we do have the EU Digital Markets Act. And actually, if you look at that regulation, there's quite a few provisions within it where it is immediately clear that getting the choice architecture right is going to be critical to the effectiveness of the provisions and therefore to firm compliance. And so in a digital context, what we might call field trials in academia and also in the CMA's report in this area is often called A-B testing. And it's really likely, I think, that under the DMA and potentially under the UK <clears throat> regulation, the gatekeeper platforms are going to need to do quite a lot of that sort of testing to demonstrate their compliance. So there's a really big relevance there. And obviously the regulators will then be looking at what testing is happening and, and, and what the outcomes are. So obviously there are pros and cons of different forms of behavioural testing, lab experiments, field trials, etc. Sometimes triangulation can be really helpful. Sometimes you may only be able to have one or the other, but if you, as long as you choose the best one, that's um, always going to be better than what we would have otherwise, and sometimes will be just immensely valuable. So that's the context, and I think it's really all of that context that, um, as I understand it, led the CMA to publish this new um, and very useful paper on experiments at the CMA, which Oli is going to take you through. I have already, with my academic hat on, commended it to um, my students. So I, I, I think it's a, a very good piece of work. And in particular, it also includes some very helpful case studies. So if if nothing else, I really hope at the end of this uh, session that everyone goes and has a look at the report um, and uh, at least is aware of it as a resource for the future. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. I'm really looking forward to the event. Thank you very much, Amelia. Some really insightful comments, I think, for all of us there, particularly uh, the, the suggestion that actually experiments can help us figure out what doesn't work as well as what does work. Um, so thank you very much for that. Uh, I'd now like to introduce Ollie Sugg, who's a senior um, advisor in the Behavioural Hub, and who's going to talk us through the paper that we've recently published. Thanks very much, Laura. And before I get into discussing the paper, um, in the spirit of discussing the value of experiments to regulators like the CMA, and because as behavioural scientists, we can't resist uh, the opportunity for an experiment. We thought we'd actually run an experiment with some of you first. So um, some of you would have directly received an invitation to, to this event, um, but not all of you received the same invitation. So um, we randomised whether you would receive one of two emails. The first email um, gives you all the key information, you know, it gives you a friendly invitation. Um, and then asks you at the bottom there to see, to, to, to register on our Eventbrite page. The other half of you received an email that draws a little bit more on behavioural science, um, where we added a call to action at the top in the title, asking you to register now, and also um, more prominently um, put the link up in the first line of the email asking you to register. Um, and so, what did we find? Well, it seemed to work. Um, increasing sign up rates by 68% um, uh, is what the data found. And maybe with a bigger sample, um, we might have received more responses from journal editors. Um, but yeah, hopefully this bit of fun shows how experiments can work and hopefully sets the scene for a great event this afternoon. So what are experiments? Um, put simply, they are a type of uh, research methodology that aims to rigorously quantify the causal impact of a practice on an outcome. Um, if we randomly allocate enough people to see different things, to go through different uh, consumer journeys, um, then uh, we can assume that the groups are sufficiently similar in their observable and unobservable characteristics and therefore the differences in outcomes between those groups we can attribute to whatever the differences difference was between the journeys that those groups experienced. 
and this type of result can be very useful for policymakers and regulators, and as we will hear about more today. I'll now give a quick overview of what the um, paper that we published earlier this year on experiments at the CMA uh, includes, but if you'd like to see more detail, then it's available online, and please go take a look. Um, the paper goes through um, a series of principles um, of how we intend to run experiments at the CMA. Um, these aren't intended to be fully prescriptive, um, but they draw on best practice from academia, particularly in social sciences, but also from other organisations who have been running experiments um, for quite a long time now, and we'll be hearing from some of those organisations in the panel. So first, why might we want uh, to run an experiment at the CMA? Well, we might want to test a uh, remedy. Um, while monitoring remedies can be helpful, um, it can be difficult to know if the changes in outcomes we observe are due to the remedy that we've implemented or potentially due to other factors um, in the environment. And we might want to use an experiment to determine which remedies we want to use, how long to use them for, um, and how we can design those remedies most effectively. We also might want to explore uh, theories of harm. Um, for instance, if we are trying to establish whether a certain practice used by a firm uh, might adversely affect consumer decision making, particularly in uh, new areas where there may not be as much existing research. Second, when might the CMA run an experiment? And we can think about this uh, three sort of elements to this decision. First, we might want to run an experiment when it is valuable. That might be where there's limited existing evidence, where other methodologies might not be appropriate, um, when it would reduce the uncertainty with which we're making uh, a decision, um, and also importantly where consumer behaviour is uh, directly relevant to the case that we are working on. So then when it's feasible, will we have um, will we be able to recruit a sufficiently big and representative sample of the consumers that will be affected? Um, and also, will an experiment be sufficiently valid, um, both within the experiment and if we want to extrapolate those results to other situations um, for the purposes that we're using it for? We also want it to be proportional. So will it be worth the costs, both in terms of financial costs, but also time and resource um, that uh, is required on uh, these projects. And finally, how will we run experiments? Um, I'll, I'll leave the details of these points to the paper, um, but some of the things we might consider are how will we recruit samples? What type of consumers might we want to include? How will we make sure that they're representative? Um, how will we develop the interventions? So what uh, different journeys will people go through in the experiment? What outcomes will we, be, will we measure and over how long? Um, how will we analyse the results? Uh, what will be the primary sort of uh, results that we'll be looking for out of the experiment? And then what will our governance processes be around the experiment? and How will we disseminate and publish those results afterwards? We're looking forward to using these principles in practice and conducting experiments um, in the near future. And hopefully the panel give further inspiration the potential value that experiments can bring to regulation. I'd now like to welcome our panel members. So if uh, online panel members want to um, turn their cameras on and Karen, if you want to uh, join me in here. Uh, so we have, um, firstly, we have in the room with us, we've got Karen Croxon. Um, Karen is the Deputy Chief Economist and Head of Economics, Behavioural Science and Data Science at the Financial Conduct Authority. Uh, Karen leads the FCA's scientific research programme and has built an economic and social data science function to deepen understanding of consumers and markets. Uh, so welcome, Karen. Uh, we've also got online, I can see everybody's there, which is great. Uh, we've got Martin Sweeney. Uh, Martin is a senior evaluation advisor at the Evaluation Task Force, which is a joint cabinet office HM Treasury unit providing specialist evaluation and evidence support to UK government departments. And previously, Martin worked as a senior researcher at the Behavioural Insights team. We've got Josanna Mastor. Uh, 
Giozana is a senior uh, enforcement officer in the Authority for Consumer Markets in the, in the Netherlands and the coordinator of the Behavioural Insights team uh, for the Netherlands Authority for Consumers and Markets. She has a PhD in social psychology and has been working in the field of applied behavioural science for over 10 years. So welcome, Giozana. We've also got Alessandro Quisti. Uh, Alessandro is the Trustees Professor of Information Technology and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University's Heinz College. His research combines economics, behavioural research and data mining to investigate the role of privacy in a dig digital society. And his studies have promoted the revival of the economics of privacy and advanced the application of behavioural economics to the understanding of consumer privacy valuations. Uh, welcome, Alessandro. And then finally, last but not least, we've got Andreas Jesperson. Uh, Andreas is Deputy Head of Consumer Policy uh, Unit in the Danish Competition and Consumer Authority. He's worked on integrating behavioural insights and experimentation into consumer and competition policy for almost a decade. And he's the Danish Competition and Consumer Authority's expert on consumer behaviour, uh, as well as their Deputy Consumer Policy Director. So welcome, Andreas, and welcome to all of our panellists. Very pleased to have you here today. Um, so just to, to start off with opening um, this, this topic, I thought maybe we could start with the academic perspective on, on uh, online and field experiments. So, Alessandro, what questions can online and field experiments help us to answer? Well, well um, first of all, thank you for having me and uh, congratulations on the CMA putting out these, uh, this document and so many uh, great experiments in, in the last few years. So, uh, I'll start by noting that there is no perfect study, no perfect um, empirical methodology. I, I look at um, online and field experiments as uh, one important uh, um, um, weapon in this broader arsenal of empirical methodologies, which range from uh, qualitative research interviews, case studies, and go through lab, lab experiments, and, and then end up with this uh, field, the large-scale field online experiments that uh, we, we all have been doing. Um, perhaps uh, field experiments nowadays are particularly important and really, really useful because at least in the field I work on, which as you mentioned is uh, online privacy, um, what happens to consumer data once it is collected uh, is, uh, is really a black box. It's, it's incredibly difficult to, 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 uh, to, to understand and study unless we use experimentation. And by experimentation, we can try to triangulate different data points to try to reconstruct a perhaps imperfect, but nevertheless a valuable picture of what may be happening to online data flows, as well as how people, consumers, make decisions about uh, data flows. Um, I work both on uh, um, field natural experiments and field uh, control experiments. And again, going back to my uh, opening statement, uh, there is no perfect tool, there is no perfect methodology. Um, each tool has its own trade-offs. Natural experiments are great for ecological validity. Just look at how the marketing, economic, uh, IT communities have reacted to the enactment of the GDPR. The GDPR has created an explosion, not just of privacy policies online, but it's created an explosion of empirical research in uh, these different fields. And those are natural experiments which are useful, right? Because they can uh, give regulators a sense of uh, the downstream impact of expected and unexpected um, of uh, the regulation um, they have passed. Uh, and control experiments are, uh, the, to me, the coolest thing about control digital experiments um, in, in our digital economy and digital society is that they allow to some extent to transpose um, uh, both the results and, um, and theories that we may have developed initially uh, in the lab and test them at much larger scale with much higher ecological validity, right? So in, in my young career, we have done a number of studies first in the lab uh, trying to understand how consumers make decisions about personal data and how uh, choice architecture may affect those decisions, anything from uh, um, framing default effects and so forth, 
Um, and we first can get some results in the lab and those results are useful in the lab because under the lab we can very tightly, very tightly control uh, most of the factors we believe to be important in, uh, in the design of the experiment. But then when we can uh, transpose what we have learned, what we have learned in the lab and we can transpose it into field experimentation, well, we, we, we may lose a little bit of internal validity perhaps. And by internal validity, I mean the fact that when you do field experiments, you, you, you may have less tight control on different experimental conditions. You, 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 you may have potentially um, some challenges with potential confounds that may, ar may arise in the field, but we gain external validity. We gain a more ecological validity. We can see whether our experiments and our theories are really work in the field, which is important, right? Because uh, when you're thinking about uh, privacy trade-offs, how people make decisions about privacy trade-offs, or how people make, dec make decisions about security trade-offs, uh, um, how they react to fishing. Um, sometimes uh, what you get from the lab is not necessarily going to match uh, the real experience in the field because uh, the incentives are, are different. Uh, the, the, the real incentives um, in the field uh, may be harder to, to be much replicated um, in a lab. So in a nutshell, um, I look at uh, field experimentation as one tool among many, but an incredibly powerful tool, particularly now due to this uh, black box uh, aspect of the data economy that I was referring to earlier. And if you like, I can provide you know, more specific examples of work we've been doing, but let me stop for the moment, let me stop here. Thank you very much, Alessandria. That's really insightful. Um, so maybe we can also get the regulatory perspective on this. So Yosanna, uh, what value can regulators get out of experiments? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the aim of uh, regulation is uh, to, um, uh, to find um, uh, what harmful practices are um, are used by in, in markets and also to find effective remedies. And I think for both both these uh, aims of a regulator, uh, experiments are extremely useful in um, in finding the answer to that. Because how do you know uh, what interventions you, uh, you you consider are effective uh, and which are not? Uh, just as uh, Emilia already said in her introduction. Um, Experiments uh, really help us uh, find the answers to these uh, these things. Uh, it gains insight into uh, practices that might be harmful. Um, it, it helps finding interventions, but uh, it can also use be used uh, as a tool, for example, for uh, developing effective um, communication strategies. Or it can help also in finding. Uh, knowledge on decision-making behavior or compliance behavior in organizations. And these are all things that we do as a, as a behavioral team within the uh, Authority for Consumers and Markets. Um, so yeah, I think it's, uh, it's really uh, important to do uh, experiments as a regulator. Thank you, Zana. Uh, and so we spoke a bit about experiments and the value there for, for regulators, but there are, of course, other research methods that aren't experimental. And so, Martin, how should we think about the evidence from online or field experiments in comparison to those other research methods and evidence? Are they better? Are they better? Oof, that is a that's a tough question. Um, you know, I, I would just say that, you know, there are other sorts of questions that we care about, which like aren't as easily or credibly answerable by experiments as well, I'd say. So, you know, experiments are really good at estimating the effect of your program or an intervention on a particular outcome, but they'll but they'll struggle to answer those black box questions, right? They'll struggle to answer the questions that are really important, which is, you know, trying to understand the nature and scale of the problem that your experiment's trying to tackle in the first place. So like how prevalent are certain practices in a given marketplace? Um, why is your program or intervention working? or why is it not working? Um, was was your program, was your intervention actually delivered as you intended it to be? You know, experiments can't always answer these questions very neatly. And so um, I think it's it's important to be thinking about like other approaches and other methods that can really add value. So, you know, you can look to kind of qualitative 
research, like implementation process evaluations. These can really help you shed light on what worked about a particular program, you know, who it worked for, how it was delivered, how it was received, what could be improved next time. Um, and it could be useful to like combine some of these qualitative methods with, you know, experiments or or kind of other quasi experimental methods, other high quality impact evaluation methods. So um, yeah, no, others might feel differently. Personally, I don't know if I'd go as far to say that experiments are better. I think I do think experiments can be like the strongest option that regulators and that government departments often have in terms of understanding what works, but we need different methods to answer different questions. Um, you know, and we sometimes have access to different types of data, different opportunities that kind of present themselves to answer some of these questions in real world settings sometimes. So, you know, speaking for my team, like the evaluation task force, we really want to see more use of experiments within government um, and including within regulators, but we recognize like we need a range of methods and approaches because that is like what decision makers need. They need a range of methods and approaches to answer the questions that they have. So. Yeah, I, th I think as policymakers, we'd probably be lost if we only had experiments. I think we need some other methods. Yeah. Thanks very much, Martin. And of course, uh, academics and uh, regulators are not the only people to do experiments. So, Karen, what's the role of experiments at regulated firms? Uh, it's a great question because I think you know experiments are you know absolutely not not only for the academics or the the regulators. I think we'd all recognise that and. Um, I think experiments could play uh, you know, a helpful role for many firms just in really understanding their customers and supporting them to get to good outcomes. In the case of regulated firms, you know, and I don't want to overstep here, so let me kind of focus just a little bit concretely on financial uh, services here in the UK, uh, where the FCA um, regulates the markets and you know, is looking to protect consumers, promote effective competition, uh, among other, our other objectives. And, you know, it's, it's worth just thinking about the holistic approach there because we're very principles based and outcome focused. Um, we uh, recently set out the outcomes or underlying the outcomes that we expect there and look to raise the bar on consumer protection through our new consumer duty, which comes into force at the end of the month. Um, so we're looking for firms to do things like uh, ensure that products and services are suitable for consumers, that consumers can get fair value, uh, that they uh, that the consumer understanding is where it needs to be so that consumers are empowered, can really take well informed decisions that would be in their best interest. Um, and then really strong consumer support from the firms around all of that across the entire journey. So these are the outcomes. Um, and we're looking for the uh, we're looking for firms to be accountable and, and specifically their senior managers inside the firms uh, to be accountable for these kinds of outcomes. So inherently, I think you sort of you're in a world there where this, where where you're meeting a lot of important empirical questions. These are empirical questions, and I think, um, uh, you know, Amelia put it well. Um, you know, when she talked about the difficulty of sort of anticipating ahead of time the impact, for instance, of um, a particular choice, one particular choice architecture architecture versus another. Um, so there are myriad important um, empirical questions, and under our consumer duty, we want firms to be um, testing their approaches uh, and understanding the impact of their approaches and um, really uh, doing, doing the best for consumers um, through an evidence-based approach. Now, um, experiments aren't the only way forward there, but could be part of the picture. I think we recognise and you know, have recognised in the duty that um, firms will be in different places in terms of some of the internal capabilities that they have, the experience and the skills. Not every firm is going to be set up to run uh, you know, randomised controlled trials in the field. Um, but we have provided some guidance on the kinds of approaches that might be um, might be relevant and valid and um, desirable here and how that might vary by the context uh, as well. But just give a little bit of a flavour of some of the you know ways it can add value. Um, I mentioned consumer understanding, uh, you know, as one of the out outcome areas, if you like. And um, obviously there you can be thinking about, well, you know, how do how do consumers interact with the community? How do what difference do our communications uh, and disclosures make? Uh, how are consumers interact with these? What are they getting from them? And how is that supporting good consumer understanding? And that, you know, that's quite narrow. There's obviously a wider you know, set of issues that can come in there a bit more holistically thinking about the entire consumer journey that is created end to end um, and, and that choice architecture across it. Um, 
you know, there'll be the, there'll be sophisticated firms out there that already are doing um, A/B testing, leveraging large-scale data, quite sophisticated data strategies and testing approaches. Um, if these are being used, for instance, already to maximise sales and think about sort of how to grow uh, the market and so on, I think what we'd be looking for is that that same level of sophistication, a sort of concern of those capabilities, are also being deployed to support um, the right kind of outcomes for consumers in the market. Uh, and I would just sort of note as well that as the regular, you know, there's obviously a little bit of a interaction here as the regulator. We run the experiments ourselves. We'd like to talk a bit more about one or two of those uh, through the course of this. But we do sometimes um, work with firms in the field and sort of partner on testing out or supporting the testing uh, scientifically of uh, different approaches in the field. Um, that we obviously there are limit, you know, I think we've got about 60,000 entities in across uh, financial services. So that's not every single case uh, by a long way. Um, um, but um, that is uh, something that I think can also bring um, value here. Thanks very much, Karen. And Yovana, I wondered if you wanted to also follow up on this particular question, in particular thinking about the ACM's guidelines on protection of the online consumer. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't, couldn't agree more with that. Uh, okay. um, uh, we we developed the guidelines uh, for the protect protection of the online consumers, um, uh, in which we highlight uh, the how, how we interpret uh, the regulation uh, surrounding um, uh, online misleading, and um, within these guidelines, we uh, stated several principles in which we um, yeah explain to uh, businesses that we um, uh, think information should be understandable and um, all kinds of things that Karen also highlighted. Um, but one thing we also uh, uh, put in our um, uh, guidelines as a principle is that we urge uh, companies to also test, uh, so A-B test or in other ways, test their uh, choice architecture. Uh, not only on conversion rates or sales, uh, but also on these um, aspects that are important for uh, uh, consumer decision making. For example, understandability of information, uh, clarity, um, uh, you know, uh, um, everything that supports uh, consumer decision making and um, uh, helps people to make better decisions. Um, so yeah, I think uh, uh, it's it's not uh, an obligation. Um, so it's not uh, uh, um, necessary to to do this. And of course, every uh, depending on the on the size of of a business, it's uh, the the techniques that they can use or um, have in house are are different. Um, but I think uh, that that is really important. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, maybe it's also nice to say a little bit about um, uh, some research we did, which was also mentioned in the in the CMA report about uh, experiments, um, because we um, uh, when this these guidelines came out, we also did a lot of uh, experiments, lab experiments, but we also collaborated with uh, um, markets, uh, uh, certain organizations. Uh, to test uh, also, for example, with A-B tests um, uh, to validate the, the, the lab experiments that we did as, a, uh, as an authority. And, it, and that is a really nice way to make sure that uh, the things you, you test with your experiments are also valid in, in online uh, or in the, in the real world. And uh, that actually made a, made a large difference uh, in in our uh, enforcement actions, but also in uh, um, getting collaboration from um, the businesses to change their uh, uh, practices. Thanks, Yosanna. I think that leads really nicely in, into the next question, which is for Andreas. Um, so we've talked a bit already about the importance of external validity of, of experiments and making them generalizable to, to real life, but how can we make online experiments as close to real life as possible and, and why is that important? Thanks, thanks, thanks Laura. Um, I, I guess the annoying answer is that it's not always important. It kind of depends on what you're testing or what you want from your experimentation. So if we are testing ability and certain elements influence on 
consumer's ability to do something. It might be, you know, that a highly artificial experiment is, is actually better. Um, so I like to say that if we want to know the fastest runner, you know, the Olympic stadium is probably better than a busy street because it, you know, it isolates the effects and has less complexity. Um, so if that's what we care about, you know, experiment, artificial experiments that doesn't look anything like the real world are fine. Uh, still needs a lot of, you know, technical ability to design those, but, but it's not realism we're after. Um, so, you know, for optimization, that, that could be fine, but obviously we often care about things that hasn't anything to do with optimization. So when we move into preferences and how do certain parts of the online choice architecture affect consumer preferences, it's kind of hard to pay people to sort of have certain preferences because it kind of violates what you're trying to, to look for. Um, so we use basically immersion and stuff. Uh, we, we want people to feel like they're making something that resembles actual choices in the market. And the easiest thing, you know, way to get immersion is to make stuff look as if it is a real market. And that means, you know, we have to pay a lot of attention to details. So the imagery we use, the user journey we set up, the complexity, the language, how choices are presented, all of these things matter immensely. So we need to think carefully about how we, how do we deviate from that situation we're trying to evaluate and use the experiments to sort of calculate the effects for. Um, and here we can, you know, we have a range of different tools or factors we need to take into account. So the, the actual design is obviously incredibly important. It needs to look something like what people meet in the market. Then, um, the descriptions we use, I think that's probably one of the things we often struggle with. We're not marketeers, and it is difficult to achieve the same level of expertise in communicating as um, you know people who actually run websites. So, but but how we describe the options that people have to to choose from matters, you know, immensely for how people interact with it. Um, then we have incentives uh, in in the real world. It kind of matters what we buy. We care about, you know, the value we get from from our options, um, and that is one of the, you know, really tricky things when we do these kinds of policy orientated experiments. Um, we want to try to make the incentive not just sort of a cash bonus because that we don't buy cash bonuses in the real world. Um, so we try to, so we, at the KFST or the DCGA, we we try to sort of be clever about incentives and uh, kind of implement them in a way that fits with the, the thing we're looking for. In We ran an experiment that's also mentioned in your excellent paper on uh, social media and commercial um, information on social media uh, for kids. So how does influence the marketing influence kids' decisions? And for as an incentive in this, we um, gave kids the options to pick some of the products that they were actually shown sort of the influencer marketing for. So that that makes the incentive sort of a natural part of the experiment. It doesn't fall outside uh, what these kids are sort of looking for. Um, we've also run experimentation on uh, ranking, on online travel agencies, and there we use sort of gift cards for some of the hotels that people picked. So that is a much more much better way of using, you know, to a much better way to use incentives than just giving people a bonus if they can, you know, remember this or that part of, uh, of the experiment or or some particular information. Um, I guess it's, uh, you know, finally, it's important for two, why do we need sort of these very realistic experiments? I think it's important for two reasons. One is it, you know, it gives much better external validity. It's much more likely that people would act like this in the real world. I also think, you know, a, a particular problem from a policy perspective is you often want to use that experiment to sort of inform someone else within the policy system. And people who you know, don't have a lot of ex experimental experience are just more convinced if it looks real uh, than if you come with this you know, highly artificial experiment. It can be very difficult translating those findings to a non-expert audience. So that is a, an added bonus for why we should you know, seek to use more realistic experiments. 
thanks, Andreas. I think lots of interesting points on, on realism there. Um, so, Karen, the FCA has some experience of creating realistic um, experiments. I think you think like your, your high risk investments online platform. Are you able to talk us through your experience a little bit? Yeah, thanks. And, you know, I really appreciated, uh, you know, the points from Andreas there. And I think, you know, that really, um, you know, recognise those all of those considerations in in our work and our approach. Um, I think, you know, this isn't it, it isn't quite so vital in every use case uh, for the regulator, but certainly can have value. And then I think when we are about, um, you, you know, looking for that when when that external validity, validity and putting kind of policy into you know, into the real world, uh, oftentimes there it is important to try to um, have a look at how consumers would interact with the remedy in a more immersive way. Um, happily, I think um, digital technology, you know, has just opened up some fantastic opportunities for all of us uh, on that front. And, you know, it's been it's been really a pleasure and, and fascinating to be able to kind of be part of that journey at the FCA and sort of see how our teams have been able to embrace that in recent years. Um, it's always a, an important sort of consideration, you know, do we set up an environment and, and which way do we do it? Um, the cost of that is coming down all of the time. So you can set up, uh, you know, a realistic online simulation. Recently, you mentioned our high risk investments work. So they, you know, this is one example, but last year, we um, we set up a, uh, a fictitious uh, website as a platform for an interrelated set of online experiments in the context of high risk investment decision making. So, uh, you know, just as a context point there, we had observed uh, through some of our research that during the pandemic uh, interest and sort of a take up of high risk investments have been growing. Um, the, the, that can be the right approach for some people, but we knew also from some other research that there were uh, challenges for, for some uh, consumers out there in terms of really um, understanding the high risk investment landscape and what exactly uh, you know, was at stake. You know, the fact that uh, maybe the return is really attractive, very, very high, but you possibly could lose all of your investment. Um, and do our consumers really empowered in that context? So we were working very closely with our policy colleagues and there were questions about sort of um, is there is there scope here to strengthen a need and scope to strengthen the consumer journey, thinking about the choice architecture and some, some of the elements there. So we set up this fictitious website um, and we tested ways to do that. Uh, one of the facets uh, of that was that there were a few was looking at um, risk warnings and the design of the risk warnings and positioning and so on and the aesthetics around that and thinking about the you know both the content uh, the content but also salience and sort of bringing in behavioral you know very much grounded in the behavioral science thinking to try to sort of design uh you know a few variants of this that would be worth testing and so we did that we got some interesting results from that and some other experiments and ultimately they were used by our policy colleagues to kind of shape the, the the rules in that space and strengthen the consumer journey um did we go to a lot of lengths to set up uh, the platform and try and make it pretty realistic? Yes, I, th I think the team really, you know, kind of can't take credit for that personally, but I think the team really did. And um, so there was a lot of reviewing of real world websites. Uh, you know, how are they set up? What is the experience? And, um, you know, embedding clickable links, the ability to navigate and browse the website in different ways. It was looking pretty authentic uh, to me. Um, we removed, you know, we didn't, we didn't, brand this uh, in any kind of real world way. We want to abstract away from any sort of branding effects and sort of really try to isolate um, the impact of the choice architecture and some elements there that could be uh, generalized around and where we could could, could potentially write rules around uh, this. So those was those were some of the considerations. I should um, caveat this by saying that I think, you know, there and, and in pretty much every other environment you're going to set up, you're going to um, have reflections about some of the limits, uh, limitations mm. as well. And we, we did there. And um, it is very, very important. I think this links um, back to and Andreas' point about, you know, the close working with policy colleagues and really the, the translation of the results into the real world implications of what you can take from this and potentially hang um, policy off. Uh, there were, you know, th there's a careful approach needed mm. there. And you need to factor in, and you know, we, we did in that experiment and other experiments, you need to factor in sort of the li limitations of the world that you've set up 
what you can take from it and what could safely be be uh, you know carried forward into into a policy approach. But uh, it was really interesting work. I get very excited about that kind of work, not because I think we should be doing it left, right, and centre. I think it's you know part of a wider toolkit and uh, it needs to be all fully proportionate. And you know you have to think very carefully about all your all of your resources resourcing uh, as a regulator but um the the rise of digital is certainly making this much more possible you can be creative and scientific at the same time and i think you know deliver some real value for consumers thanks karen and i'd like to explore this question about limitations and sort of how you present the, the results of experiments a bit further so there's a question for the whole panel uh how should we use the results of experiments and in particular what happens if you find that a remedy doesn't work Uh, Andreas, I think he's got his hand up. Yeah, thanks. I mean, that is that's an interesting question. Um, I think there is a risk when it comes to using experimentation within sort of a policy debate uh, for people to um, cling on to sort of the magnitudes of effects that the experiment produces. So we feel very confident from an experiment that some piece of information would improve consumer decision making, but the magnitude of that decision within the actual market, you know, is much more uncertain. So I think that we need to be kind of careful when we talk about, you know, experimental results like this. And maybe, although, you know, people can disagree, but, you know, in, in the olden days in psychology, for instance, you didn't even report magnitude, you just reported, you know, the effect, the effect direction and whether it was significant. Um, and there's some value in that because it recognizes that we can't really, we can't be certain that the this translates one to one to the actual market. Um, in terms of the other thing, you know, sometimes we should just abandon a remedy. Obviously, you know, if it doesn't work, you know, I I I laud the FDA for you know for taking that decision, you know, having tried stuff uh, that didn't work. But sometimes. Uh, we also need to recognize that remedies serve more functions than just effects in the market. Uh, you know, sometimes they are uh, about justice or about, you know, prop being proper or about in making sure that some kind of, you know, some consumers have, could access some information, even though most don't. Um, so it can serve multiple purposes and we need to be really good at recognizing that multitude of purposes before we just slam it down on effect grounds. Thanks, Andreas. Does anybody else want to, to come in on, on this question? Karen? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm happy to. I'm happy to. And, um, you know, I think you also know, uh, you know, we were, we've been colleagues at the, the FCA. I mean, at the FCA, we, um, I think we're really committed to publishing uh, the results from all of our experiments and so all of the results, um, whether the uh, uh, whether the results are, are sort of positive um, in the sense of, you know, something something uh, to take from that or non-significant or even sort of negative uh, results that don't really conform with our hypotheses. Um, we, we're we very committed to be, being transparent, I think, in this space, uh, tackling, you know, heading off uh, publication bias, uh, but also, you know, really, you know, the, the big prize, I think, is in proving the evidence base over time and really learning uh, and making sure that when we do uh, you know, commit to changes in the real world that could come with cost, uh, you know, and need to be considered very carefully that these are um, our best bets, you know, that these are, these are the evidence-based uh, approaches um, as far as we can tell to take forward. It can feel, I think, for, for researchers involved, you know, all this careful work and testing, it can feel uh, possibly like a little bit of a setback or a bit disappointing in the moment um, to get a negative result or something that just seems a bit in, insignificant. Um, and you had some prior around that, um, but it's hugely valuable. And I think and, um, Amelia touched on this as well. And we can actually work with, you know, you don't sort of put that stuff in the bin. Uh, as I found out when I was doing my theory PhD and had a lot of stuff in the bin. Um, but <laughs> we don't put that stuff in the bin. You can, um, you know, you can take that forward into retesting. You can um, learn from that and you can come up with a better approach. And then that can go into the field, which is kind of hugely satisfying and feels, you know, feels very robust at that point. We um, we had a, uh, a case of this recently, a small case of this in some of our work um, related to sustainability disclosure. So, again, in the investment um, space where some of the results, uh, you know, weren't necessarily as we 
uh, you know, might have been expecting, but we were able then to uh, weave those into the design of some focus groups and some, uh, we ran a second experiment and then we got to a much better, or we got to a good place uh, with things. Thanks very much, Karen. So, so I think lots, lots for us there about learning from um, from experiments, even if they don't show us exactly what, what we expect. Um, Martin, would you like to come in? Yes, I, yes, I agree I, with a lot of what, what both, both Andreas and Karen were saying there. You know, I think um, first thing I would do is just like check how confident I am in the experiments conclusions. Like, you know, am I confident about its, its internal validity? Did things go to plan? Um, secondly, you know, kind of like I was saying, there are other research methods that can shed some insight into why things don't work. So if you've kind of designed in some qualitative research into your evaluation, into your experiment, you could maybe start to get some indication about why things may have not gone to plan. And I think those two things can maybe like, be really helpful in terms of helping you and your colleagues decide whether to kind of try again or to actually pack up and, and move on and kind of try try something else potentially. I think there's definitely a challenge when the end users really like the remedy and really like the program, regardless of whether it actually worked. And I think we can see this in I've seen, I've seen examples of this in my work, not necessarily with remedies, but with other kind of types of government programs where the end users really value the program, but quite high quality randomized control trial experiment finds that it just does not work. And so that can be a challenge for the senior leaders then who have to make decision about whether to kind of continue um, or not. But yeah, I think that I think that point can probably be a challenge. Thanks very much, Martin. And Alessandra, I mean, the publication bias and trying to avoid that is, is something that academics are thinking a lot about. What's your thoughts on this issue? Right, uh, right. Publication bias, I, I would argue, is even more problematic in academic research compared to the research regulators are doing due to the particular and perverse incentives uh, in, in academia and in how journals uh, um, re for a long while have tended to uh, review uh, submitted manuscripts and only uh, positive results with um, interesting finding and statistically significant finding can, can be published. This seems to be uh, finally changing. Um, journals are more open, thankfully, uh, to uh, now results or negative results. Um, there is a tendency in, uh, in my field to uh, uh, pre-register experiments and that started in uh, um, behavior research but it has extended now to economic research, market research. That's a very good thing. Uh, there is also a positive trend in terms of some journals, including top journals um, across fields, uh, pre-accepting a manuscript based on the experimental design, on the theory, on the research question before even actually seeing the results so that Ties the uh, ties the publication not to the specific result that will be found and reduces the likelihood of this uh, um, publication bias pressure, and instead ties the the acceptance of, of of the study on the importance of the research question and the and the clarity depth uh, precision of the experimental methodologies. Finally, uh, I would like to add in terms of how can regulators and all of us really use the research, the, the, the results of the research. Well, meta-analysis meta ultimately to me remains the gold standard. Um, and this kind of goes back to the point I think Martin was making of combining a diversity of methodologies in order to address one research question, but also combining a diversity of studies, right? Because even the best study may for reasons completely unrelated to uh, the author's ability, produce wrong results. Um, once we start having 15 studies, all pointing in the same direction, now we have uh, substantial evidence that we may trust about uh, the strength of an effect. So uh, meta studies and meta analysis do remain the gold standard and suggest uh, caution in uh, jumping the gun on the results of one single, perhaps super interesting, but still one single sample size of one. The sample size of the study could be 80,000 people, but it's still sample size of one study. And we should be careful about jumping the gun with a sample size of one. Thanks very much, uh, Alessandro. Um, so I've got a couple more questions for the panel, but just as a reminder, um, if you have questions as well, please do put them in the Q&A function and we'll be collating some of those to, to ask the panelists shortly. 
And um, so another question uh, for everybody in the panel, what are the areas where you'd most like to run experiments and maybe see experiment, experiments be run in the next five years or so? Uh, Martin. Or I'll go here. Um, this is quite a policy focused experiment um, in water resource management, so it's kind of an off watts territory. I know they're in the headlines these days with Thames Water, but um, so I think you know there is pretty unsustainable water consumption in England. I think water consumption per capita is about 25, 30 percent above sustainable levels. Um, and their government targets to kind of get households to reduce their water consumption. You know, water shortages are damaging for human health, environment, the, the, the entire economy. Um, and I think there's a bit of a missed opportunity right now for water companies to kind of use existing evidence that kind of comes from studies, most of which are actually from the US, that kind of shows similar to like there's a big research in kind of energy about giving feedback to households around how their energy consumption compares to their neighbors is a pretty proven effective intervention to actually get households to reduce their energy consumption a bit. So using those same insights, but applying them to water. Um, there are a few studies in the US which show this approach is really, um, re really impactful. But Americans use twice as much water. They've just got bigger lawns and more space. So I'm really interested in whether actually some of these results can translate over into the UK context. I think there's a big policy need to kind of answer this question, and actually reduce household water consumption in a way that is cost effective, which doesn't require water companies to build a lot more supply infrastructure, or spend a lot of money um, on other things that kind of improve water resource management and and the kind of sustainability of future sources. So that would be my set of experiments and um, I'll fought to its credit. Um, has kind of opened its doors and I've had a few chats with them and they're definitely thinking about opportunities to get water companies to think about doing a bit more of this work. Yeah. Thanks very much, Martin. Uh, Andreas, I think you also had some comments on this. Yeah, um, interesting question. Uh, I think uh, I'd like the keys to some of the social media companies, uh, you know, UX teams. Uh, it is something that is, you know, incredibly hype in the policy debate at the moment the impact of social media on young kids health especially mental health um, and it's kind of either you know one of the worst market externalities since leaded gasoline or it's one of the worst you know uh, mistaking correlation for causation uh, since i don't know when but but something is going on and i fear without experimentation it's going to be you know intuition that's driving all the policy responses and it is, you know, these markets are enormous. They matter for so many different reasons, uh, both commercial and uh, culturally. And just smacking them down, you know, based on intuition seems wrong. But on the other hand, without access to real experimentation, we're not going to, you know, get any wiser to why we are seeing these huge correlations between uh, reductions in mental health. Uh, especially among young kids and the rise of these social media markets. So that is something that'd be interesting to do and would be hugely immense, uh, immensely helpful for guiding policy decisions. Thanks very much, Andreas. Uh, Yosanna. Uh, yeah, so for us, it's uh, one domain with, is, is the sustainability domain, uh, similar to uh, what Martin was uh, discussing. Um, for example, research on sustainability claims, um, but also the right to repair uh, and um, intentions to repair uh, are, are topics that are interesting for us. Uh, another domain is the digital economy, um, with all the developments within this domain also uh, on legislation um, that will be an important in, a topic for us. Um, dark patterns, uh, the harm of dark patterns, but also potential remedies of dark patterns will be an important uh, issue for us. And maybe for the little bit longer term, also we're interested in um, interactions with AI. So for example, the effects of AI on consumer decision making uh, is something that for the longer term, I think is also interesting for us. Thanks, Jovanna. Alessandro? Yeah, thanks. Um, using economic uh, terminology, 
um, I really want to do and hope more of us do studies on the allocation of value of the data economy, essentially who benefits from it? How are the benefits accrued from uh, the collection and analysis of consumer data then allocated back to different uh, stakeholders? Because uh, going back to what Andrea was mentioning, there are these tremendous negative externalities potentially associated with uh, the data economy, social media, online advertising, um, and often in the industry debate around these uh, issues, uh, the counterpoint is, uh, well, yeah, there may be these problems with privacy, there may be perhaps some unintended consequences, but from an economic perspective, everyone is benefiting from uh, data collection, tracking, and targeting. Well, are we? Um, on theoretical grounds, you can certainly make and write down economic models that based on the matching between uh, consumer preferences and the uh, advertising ecosystem ability to match those preferences with products, then everyone benefits. But you can also make theoretical arguments for why actually this type of markets lead to um, uh, surplus aggregation in the hands of few uh, oligopoly intermediaries. So ultimately, we need more empirical validation of all of this. Because if we start realizing that much of the economic surplus created from data actually does not go back to consumers or other stakeholders, but is concentrated in the hands of in, in intermediaries, uh, then together with the externalities argument that Andreas was making, now we have you know two data points which are quite important, I, I think, for regulators to, to use in understanding the implications of these uh, data concentrations in the, for, for our economies and our societies. Thanks, Alessandro. And uh, some really interesting comments there. So I think definitely a focus for, for everybody who's spoken on the digital markets and then also um, the, the water experiments that, that Martin has talked about. So I think plenty of uh, food for thought on, on where we might be able to do more experiments. Um, so the last question from me, and then we'll open up to, to audience questions. It's really a very practical question. So what skills do you need to be able to run experiments if you're thinking about doing that within regulation, within academia? What kind of skills might you be looking for? Happy, Sorry, happy yeah. to say a little <laughs> from the perspective of uh, the FCA and uh, you know, the work we're doing. So um, We've had a team uh, for a little while, um, I think since about 2014, working in the behavioural science and design space. Um, it, today, the team, it's it's quite multidisciplinary. Um, so people are coming from various backgrounds in, in, inside the team. Um, behavioural science is always important. Uh, experimental design and, you know, kind of really understanding the, uh, you know, the best practices and principles there. And um, these days, you know, we talk quite quite a lot about the opportunity around online trials and that as part of an integrated approach. Um, and there you do need some specialised skills to kind of code up these uh, you know, immersive environments uh, that we talked about. Um, and then I think, you know, when I look at our own team, uh, regardless of background, pretty much everybody in the team is also able to uh, run quantitative analysis and sort of adopt best practices there to um, be able to take the uh, you know the the data from experiments, analyze it, get to um, a good place in terms of sort of some sound interpretation of uh, the insights and evidence. And then I think you know also critically, and it's not really um, uh, it's not always seen as I think as part of the the conventional toolkit, but working inside a policy organization, a regulator, I think it's very very important to be able to translate the insights. Uh, you know, and the panel touched on that already into uh, something actionable mm -hmm. for colleagues and give a, you know, give a sense of the confidence that sure shouldn't be associated with different kinds of results and how to think about uh, the limitations as well. Um, and that itself is, I think, a really important skill, you know, and you can always get better at that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's something we really focus on, you know, so sort of telling the story of the work and, and doing that in a way that's really kind of like true to the, um, you know, to the work that's been done and what can be taken from it. Thank you. I think this is a really important point when it comes to the kind of cultural differences, perhaps, between people who regularly run experiments and people who might use experiments as well. I think there's definitely a sort of translation exercise to, to happen there. Um, I think we've got Martin as well, who, who wants to come in on this one. 
Yeah, I mean, that last point there is critical that Karen was making. I think like you need to have the kind of license to experiment within your organization oftentimes in order to kind of get the resources you need to build out that that team. And so that means, you know, being able to convince senior stakeholders that what you're trying to do like really is aligned with the organization's objectives and, and strategic priorities and, and will add value to a lot of the work that it's already doing. So I think that is like an underrated aspect maybe about kind of building a team that is enabled to kind of do some of these experiments. Um, yeah, I don't think any, there's, all the skills don't need to sit within one person, right? That's why it's like important, it's it's useful to kind of build, build a team who can kind of do this work together. Um, you know, the data is never as clean as, as, as you would hope it to be. So you definitely need some data skills some data wrangling skills somewhere. Um, I'd also say like you need to be a bit creative and crafty about, um, kind of identifying how to measure something that's quite hard to measure. Like I think sometimes you have an outcome measure in mind, but it can actually be sometimes kind of ambiguous about whether it's a net positive or um, could kind of go either way in terms of whether a consumer experiencing that outcome is actually has positive utility, positive utility or negative utility. So being, yeah, being a little bit crafty about um, understanding outcome measures and whether you actually can make a value judgment about about what they're telling you. Thanks, Martin. And yeah, certainly that's uh, often harder to do than it sounds. So uh, yeah, really important point. Um, Andreas. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you know all of these points. I think um, having at least one person in the team that doesn't come from sort of a psychology or experimental economics background is very important. Uh, there is a sense of I've met many behavioral teams and they are often very similar in terms of you know who what kind of backgrounds do we want um, and it can lead to some kind of one dimensional thinking not because these people aren't brilliant but just because they are trained similarly and then you know tend to think kind of similarly around um, you know what happens if we do this you know what's the value of this type of data and having someone without that background being able to sort of who understands the policy decision and the context but can ask different kinds of questions so someone from sociology or anthropology. I'm, I'm my own background is in philosophy and um, I wouldn't recommend anyone hiring philosophers, but you know, being creative and hiring someone who isn't, you know, doesn't fit that perfect description of an experimental uh, person is often worthwhile. Um, so yeah, it is, if it seems big enough, uh, that can make a lot of sense. Thanks, Andreas. I think this is a really important point about having that multidisciplinary um, background to the team as well. Yosana. Yeah, I also yeah. agree with all those points. Um, I think in addition, um, one thing that I di didn't hear yet is um, also in, in the start of a project, uh, talking to your colleagues and uh, defining a good research question is also a skill that you really um, must have uh, to in order to be able to tr translate these research questions into a proper experimental design is uh, is really a skill that that you should uh, master um, and also questionnaire design um, is is another uh, skill so uh, how do you translate these research questions uh, within um, uh, within a good design but also within uh, in, into a, a good questionnaire um, that is not uh, that is neutral in, in setup is is uh, something that is really a, a specific skill uh, which I find very important um, uh, and of course analytical skills as well um, maybe it also depends a little bit on the domain in which you do um, uh, experimental research. For example, uh, as we are looking into dark patterns and everything uh, surrounding uh, online misleading, um, some thing that is on our wish list as well is uh, investing in somebody um, with a background in UX design. So that is something that might also be uh, beneficial. And for other domains, it might be other uh, skills or specializations uh, that might be useful to, to get into your team as well. Thanks, Yosanna. Some really great points there as well. I mean, setting the research question at the beginning is, is also a very underrated uh, skill to, to, to have um, and very important to, to focus attention on that as well. Um, 
So I'd like to open up for uh, audience questions. I think we've got some questions that have come in online, so I'll give the people in the room a bit of a chance to, to have a think. So maybe we'll start with some online ones. So Oli, I think you, you're going to read out our first question for us. Yes, uh, I thought I'd pose a really good but challenging question from David from the Q&A. So um, he asked, most experiments in regulation seem to be focused on static consumer responses to an intervention. Are there ways to account for supply side responses and learning of consumers to intervention, either in the experiment design or repeating an experiment over time? And also just to add another hard bit, a good question from Emily on the, uh, how you can go beyond decisions as the outcomes and more getting to a point of making welfare judgments of things being good or bad. Great question. So, um, so thinking about supply side, uh, thinking about welfare benefits. Um, Andreas, do you want to, to come in on this one? Wow, oh, we can't hear you, Andreas. I think you might be on mute. Sorry. So, yeah. yeah. Th that's an excellent question. Um, I think the answer is no. Um, do not try to use experimentation to, you know, to calculate or uh reason your way into what the supply side will be i mean markets are markets and one of the wonderful things about them are their unpredictability and we shouldn't i don't think the method is fit to for you know for actually calculating stuff over tremendous periods of time uh much better research methods for doing that um and I think regulators have a lot of skill in this because it's it's what we care about and many other colleagues who are experts in the market you care about will tell you what the most likely market outcome will be and how you should you know try to take that into account in your experiment but I don't think we should use experiments to do that specifically. Thanks Andreas a, a strong response on, on that one does anybody have any other thoughts about that or also on the second part of the question about the um, the welfare effect? And just on the first part, you know, to loop back, we talked about the value of experiments to regulated firms or firms. And I think, um, you know, when I think about put myself in the shoes of somebody running a firm, you know, I think about our consumer duty and financial services. I mean, the the approach is really to um, to require firms to focus on those outcomes, and that's not a one shot um, game. Uh, that's something that then requires, um, you know ongoing focus and monitoring and updates can be made and you know things can be learned and obviously you're part of the market so there'll be you know a wider supply side response uh you know and that will that will manifest over time so i think this you know to not see things as one shot uh from the regulators firm's perspective is important i think we would hope as well that you know we see the outcomes focused approach as something um of a strength in that um you know, we want positive innovation. It's vital to good out consumer outcomes of the future, um, as well as those today. And I think um, with this kind of approach, firms really have it in their gift to sort of, um, you know, deploy new technologies, new business models, experiment, and um, you know, try to find the right way to have a you know great business and serve consumers well and get to good outcomes. And that can all evolve over time. And experimenting and testing can kind of be part of the approach. Thank you. Um, Alessandro, did you have any thoughts about this? Well, um, welfare, if, if by welfare we are talking about economic welfare, is one of those things that um, it's, uh, it's, it's possible to define it precisely on theoretical grounds, but it's very, very, very difficult to, to, to capture precisely empirically. We can, however, um, capture elements uh, factors, variables that influence welfare. Uh, for instance, in the case of uh, consumer welfare, um, some of our recent work attempts to quantify the some of the effects of consu on consumer welfare of behavioral display advertising. Uh, going back to the point I was making earlier that um, there are many claims about the benefits, economic benefits of the, the, the economy, but few of those claims are causally uh, empirically validated with precision. Well, um, often display behavioral display ads are presented as beneficial to consumers because they presented more targeted offers. Therefore, products which are closer to the interest, to the preferences of the consumer. And that is probably a correct argument in that 
there is plenty of empirical evidence suggesting that behaviorally targeted ads have higher click-through rates than non-targeted ones. So that part is true, but in economic terminology, that simply tells us about uh, search cost. Essentially, uh, these behaviorally targeted ads reduce consumer search costs. But consumer search costs are not the only variable in the consumer utility function or welfare function. There are many other factors which can impact consumer welfare when a consumer buys online through an ad. For instance, the price that the consumer ends up paying if she clicks on an ad and ends up purchasing from the merchant that bought the advertising, the quality of the vendor that the consumer would, have, would end up buying from if she were to indeed a click on that ad and complete the transaction. The experiment we did was to try to cast some light on factors such as price and vendor quality. And we found quite surprisingly that uh, behaviorally targeted ads in our experiments, okay, uh, we have to be careful about overgeneralizing, but behaviorally targeted ads in our experiments with a online population of US, US consumers. And we repeated the experiment twice. So we replicated it. Replicated, replicated it 10 months, uh, a 10 months interval. We find that those ads are associated with uh, higher prices and lower quality vendors than the, very, than the competitor products available by competitor vendors through search. And that is an example of uh, something that affects consumer welfare, but we, we, we stop short of saying, oh, therefore, uh, behavior targeted ads are good or bad for consumer welfare because we only have a, a, an imperfect picture, right? We, 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 we cannot know all the variables. We cannot capture all the variables that enter utility function, but at least we can pinpoint some, uh, some of those variables. Thanks very much, uh, Alessandro. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience in house today? Yeah. Okay. Um, I found the very careful discussion by all the panelists around how firms can make use of the machinery that they may have to maximize sales and find out important answers to business questions. It could be repurposed for uh, advancing sort of regulatory outcomes. I think that's very feasible and good in sort of uh, setups where there's a sort of dedicated sector regulator that's not going away. Not a one-shot game. They can sort of keep uh, at it and sort of employ sort of powers and etc. to sort of get firms to run these experiments if, they, if they're not willing to. But uh, in the context of something like the CMA, which is a uh, more general economy regulator and uh, may have some relatively time-limited uh, uh, involvement in particular sectors. I wonder if the panel had views, and maybe this is also highly relevant to academics, when you're facing uh, firms that perhaps don't want to know the answer or don't want to incur the costs of uh, running experiments for something that may not lead to a beneficial outcome. Any any reflections on this challenge? Great, thank you. So I'll just summarise um, for, for people online so that, to make sure that you all heard it. Um, so yes, experiments, uh, are often run in, in firms, but maybe they could be repurposed the machinery that they use um, for regulatory reasons, which works really well in, with sectoral regulators. But how how do we think about that when we, we don't necessarily have that deep uh, regulatory relationship with those firms and maybe firms actually don't want to do experiments? What what can we do? What, what thoughts do, does the panel have about that? Uh, Andreas. Yeah, yeah, that's a such a great question. I mean, having I, we've done some field trials and we don't have any powers, so we can't compel anyone to do anything. Um, and I am experiments are fragile enough that I am worried that running an experiment with someone, a firm, and you're forcing them. There are so many ways you can invalidate the results. Um, and especially if you're not privy to sort of the internal discussions in that organization, that you know almost always it is the better option to get a firm interested in the experiment and sort of giving have, making them see the perspectives in this. That is how we've run field trials always, and I think there are many different ways you can do this. Um, you can 
you can argue that you know, since something would be a market-wide remedy, you know, it's going to hit everyone, including your competitors. It's not going to shrink the market. It's just going to, you know, move people from move consumers or customers from the worst firms to the best firms. So, you know, then you appeal to the best firms um, for a field trial. Or you can say this is going to. We are offering you capabilities and capacities you don't have yourself in sort of evaluating or some kind of expertise in running the experiment that the firm might not have. Uh, so that's for lesser firms or smaller firms in, in some sectors. That can also be quite enticing. And finally, the thing that almost always works is that the firm is privy to this sort of the evolution of a policy uh, position before everyone else. So that is often you know, a real boon for them being able to both influence, get their perspective on, but also anticipate this policy before their competitors. So that can be uh, something, although, you know, as a comp competition agency, you need to be careful, but it is something that, you know, especially on consumer policy that they might sort of um, be enticed by. Thanks, Andreas. And is Andrew? Uh, yeah, I see, I see where Andreas is coming from, uh, although my view on this perhaps differs slightly from his, maybe I'm being naive or, or overly optimistic about the abilities of regulators to, 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 to compel uh, firms to do certain type of experiments, but we, we, we already have a regulation that compels financial auditing, tax auditing. Um, I, I feel that the way to go or one way to consider is to compel certain types of auditing regarding uh, data processing, consumer data, personal data processing, uh, the, the the value of this data. Sure, there may be an attempt of the by the by by the entities to 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 direct the experiments in a certain direction, but I I, I don't think it can be worse than what we have now because what we have now is essentially. Uh, um, firms choose the experiments they want to run and and those they don't want to run they also choose the scholars to work with and those they don't want to work with so we have a new form of publication bias which is no longer about publishing only only the statistically significant results but rather publishing only the studies that this large firm I think we've lost Andrew, uh, Alessandro, unfortunately. Are you back, Alessandro? Uh, yeah, I, 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 I didn't realize I fell, I fell through. Uh, I don't know where, where, where my connection dropped. It was just the last bit, I think, that, that, that we lost. So just the last sentence or so. Oh, simply that we have a new form of publication bias, which is less about the statistical significance and more about the the peak of the research question, which is, which is as problematic, if not problematic, than the current publication bias we have in academia. So I feel something should be done about this. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank um, you. Yes, Anna. Uh, yeah, to, to add to this, I, I, I also agree with uh, Andreas that it's better to uh, find companies that are willing um, and intrinsically motivated to uh, do research uh, and, and preferably do it together so you have really insights, uh, in, inside information on the, the way that they're testing, the, the parameters that they use to test on, um, and also, um, yeah, really uh, collaborate with, the, with them. It's a much more effective way than uh, really um, demanding uh, experiments, I think. Because I think we've already seen in, in practice that if if you use that method, then companies will certainly try to game it. So they will make experiments uh, and, and test things that are like not exactly what you want. So uh, I also really like the, the multiple method strategy. So uh, what we did for the travel uh, agencies was um doing an experiment a lab experiment first uh, to get some insight into um how, how things might work and uh, combine that with uh a b testing or, or research in the field um so you can have a little bit better understanding of, of how things work another option is also to combine research you you do within a lab uh, with um, uh, asking uh, companies for data that they already collected 
Um, and that is a way in which you can use your enforcement um, uh, possibilities to gain insight into the parameters that they already you uh, test without them uh, uh, having the possibility to to game it uh, basically um, so that's also an idea thanks very much Josanna and uh, thank you to to everybody I think unfortunately that's all we've got time for in terms of questions and some really great audience questions there um, so yeah I'd like you to to join me in thanking our panelists who've had uh, such a uh, insightful things to say and hopefully um, we've all learned something today so maybe if we can give them a round of applause thank you and now i'm very pleased to uh invite uh, mike walker who's our chief economist and um, to come and give us some closing remarks on the congress so first of all thank you very much to all the panelists who have disappeared from behind me so uh, karen and yuzana and andres and martin and alexander um, and to Amelia, see who did the talk at the beginning, and to Ollie and Laura for organising this. Um, and it was great to see that um, I think there's more than 100 people online. I, I don't quite know why our tech can't count beyond 99, um, but there you go. Um, <clears throat> so we pride ourselves on being uh, an evidence-based organisation. I mean, it's one of our, our six sort of values that we now have. It's obviously key to getting the answers right to the questions we have to answer. It's I think, key to our legitimacy, it's key to our independence. Um, and I, yeah, we all know if you work in this business very long, um, that the hardest bit about being evidence-based is often not weighing up the evidence. The hardest bit is often actually getting hold of the evidence. So anything that enhances our ability to get evidence must be a good thing. So on that basis, you know, on that spend, clearly a good thing, in particular to the extent that they allow us to get evidence that we are not able to get hold of. So quite a lot of talk earlier on in the panel about sort of black box concerns and you know how much is AB testing to deal with that you know that clearly is extremely useful to us if that as a way of getting hold of some of that information um, obviously a lot of the talk was about um, um, online choice architecture and trying to understand how that operates that's all about how, trying to understand how consumers you know how consumers work and that's clearly key to lots of analysis you know we care a lot about supply side of markets but we also care about the demand side um, and so it's, that's always very helpful. Um, you know, I advocated the use, more use by regulators of RCTs back in, I think, 2016, I think, when I did a BC lecture on behavioural economics. Um, and I see absolutely no reason to, to change my view on that. Um, obviously, well, my experiments, RCTs need to be well designed. Obviously, they need to have external validity, but look, fundamentally, they can increase our, our evidence base. Um, Obviously, it's still validity is not always easy, and I'm going to be very risky here and actually disagree a little bit um, with Andreas, which I know is always a bad idea because when I've tried in the past, I've always lost out. Um, but I think there's that question that was put about how should you take account of the try and take account of the supply side in your behavioural experiments? Okay, and I can quite understand that that would be very difficult to do, but equally. If we have a behavioural experiment that tells us something about how consumers are going to behave before we do anything with that piece of information, we do need to think about, OK, how will other actors in the market then respond to that change in consumer behaviour? You know, and to the extent that changing consumer behaviour changes the incentives on the firms, we need to think through how the firms might change and then what those reactions might be, because otherwise we lose, I think, some external validity. Um, uh, I do love the idea, Andrea, so I think you hit a fantastic idea that we're going to stop holding 100 metres in, in Stadia and um, so I mean, this Golden League meeting in Brussels, let's have them running across the Grand Place in the middle of July. Um, that'll be a proper test of athletic ability. Um, so, OK, so clearly these experiments can be really useful for us. Clearly also they can lead to surprising results. That's perhaps when they're most useful, actually. Um, I was reminded of... Um, uh, experiment that Ofgem did. So we, in our energy market inquiry, had this fantastic remedy, clearly a good idea, which was how do you encourage consumers to switch energy supplier because they were clearly leaving a lot of money on the table, which is great. When they're up for renewal, you send them a letter that says your existing package is going to cost you X. If you switch to either of these two suppliers, you will save whatever. And it was bespoke to the actual demand of that supplier and Ofgem we suggested it's a great way to help people switch and often said, OK, we're going to do it. Just going to check it works. And I, at the time, thought, oh, for goodness sake, it's clearly going to work. So get on with it. 
So they did this experiment and you know, they said they left it out. And typically people could save between about 150 and 200 pounds just by trivially switching. Uh, and they even had a link to make switching really easy. And it had absolutely no effect on, on consumer behavior or really marginal effect on consumer behavior. Um, clearly really interesting because that would have been really useful. That would have been an expensive remedy to impose. It wouldn't have worked. And so knowing that and then moving on to something else was very, very useful. Um, I, mean, I thought it's extraordinary, it doesn't work, but there you go. Um, uh, I thought it was a really interesting discussion, a whole discussion about negative results and, and what you do about that. And it's very, I'm very pleased to hear uh, Alexander suggesting that actually academia is getting better about this. It reminds me of that whole debate, which people still get wrong, about the difference between statistical significance and economic significance. And equally, statistical insignificance might still be economically significant. I mean, I think there's a paper book maybe, Deirdre McCluskey, um, maybe you see that. Anyway, I mean, I thought that was very important because negative results are clearly telling us something. And as a regulator, you know, OK, it may not get published in the top five journal, but it might still help us get the answer right and to, to impose the right sorts of or remedies or not impose bad ones. Um, uh, I'm, look, I mean, I'm really pleased we've issued this um, guidance on, on how we do online experiments and, and how important they are. I'm really pleased we've had this, this webinar and had, had this discussion. Um, it's obvious, I think, that this can be really useful. It's obvious we need to take a sort of interdisciplinary team approach, the point you made, Karen. And I think it's also obvious that we've got lots to learn from all different organisations. You know, if you look at the panellists, you know, we've got an academic, we've got someone from central government, we've got a couple of regulators. Um, that's all really useful. Thank you very much and thank you again for everybody for attending, in particular to all the speakers and panellists who um, made such really great points. Um, as I say, we have been recording the event, so we're hoping to be able to share that. Um, so if anybody um, would like to catch up on that, then they, they can do. And I'm sure if anybody also has questions, um, do, do come to us as well. So thanks again to everybody and uh, thanks very much.